Michelle Prada, welcome to An Act of Despairs. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing good. You know, I, I'm, I'm such a big fan of yours. I love Vita, uh, believe it or not. Oh, I'm, thank you. I'm Hispanic. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> actually, white, white Tino. Yeah, White Tino. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I really love that show. And, and, and it's such a cool character. I, and I... I I really love LA. I've spent so much time there, so I relate to it on so many levels. And then you, you're at such an amazing place in your career. I'm so excited to see where it goes. I'm so excited for you. And it, you. it's so beautiful to watch you just work. And, and, and I know the best is yet to come. So, and congratulations on season three. I know it's been it's been really exciting to kind of you know we we obviously finished shooting a while ago in November and you kind of oh hold so on you guys to, are not affected by this chaos not as far as shooting no I mean obviously we would have loved to have had like a fun premiere and with it being the yeah. final season being able to like go out and hang out together but that's not something that we can really do. So we're doing it in Zoom world. Yeah. Avatars of ourselves. Yeah, it's, I think the whole world is doing that now. But um, you know, before we dig in the work, I'm so curious to start at the beginning. You grew up in Miami, right? I did, yeah. What was that like? Uh, you know, I think the joke is that the best part about Miami is how close it is to the United States. Uh, <laughs> because... I spent so much of my life thinking that the rest of the United States was like Miami. And then as I finally was able to kind of travel more outside of even just Florida, realizing that none of the United States is like Miami, let alone any part of the world I've ever been to. So um, I feel really happy to be from there. I'm happy also that I kind of took a chance and left. But I, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a funny, it's a funny place because it really is kind of this blending of the Americas in a totally. really interesting way. And, and talk to me culturally, what, what did your parents, were they, were they Cuban or did they come from Puerto Rico or how did they end up in Miami? Well, my mom, I mean, I was raised uh, by my mom. Uh, well, I was raised by my mom and my stepdad. So even though, you know, I feel like, the big mix of all sorts of bloodlines and everything like that. But I would say culturally, I mean, my mom immigrated from Dominican Republic. So I was raised uh, with that, my, my family being very Caribbean. And then all the men in my family, like my uncles and uh, married Cuban women. So all of my tias were Cuban. And then therefore all of my cousins were Cuban. And my stepdad was Bolivian. So I was raised with a lot of different cultures wow. uh, kind of well I think specifically like Latin cultures mixed in that's amazing and and talk to me about growing up there you know because I kind of find my own experience with Miami has been it's like Vegas on water you know and, <laughs> <laughs> so did you did you enjoy growing up there was that like a fun time in your childhood and you know having the beaches and all the arts yeah. I mean, definitely. I think, though, the part of Miami I grew up in uh, was very much not like what you see on, like, the postcards. I mean, I, I did spend time there, obviously, and I lived on South Beach just for, you know, a few months. But uh, for the most part, it was, you know, a part of Miami um, called Hialeah. So it's very, uh, very Latin. I mean, there's, there's, uh, my school is predominantly black and brown and the there's you know you're walking around and the strip malls and there's stores that say we speak English and English is misspelled it's I-N-G-L-E-S -E -E. <laughs> so it was very much a very Latin part of the world and oh. uh, part of the United States where you know you you go to even like a McDonald's or whatever and they don't speak English so you have to, it was very blended. When, when you were growing up, were you speaking Spanish with your mother and your stepfather? Strangely, it's, so Spanish was my first language. Yeah. And I started speaking Spanish once I was like, yeah, well, pretty much once I started learning how to speak. But then once I got into 
uh, school, I started speaking English and that's when I started learning English. And now it's my predominant language, the one yeah. I feel most comfortable expressing myself in. But strangely enough, we didn't really uh, speak that much Spanish in the house, except for when my mom got really mad at us then. All the Spanish Oh, that she cursed in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But what's interesting is I'm one of four kids. Uh, so as the children get younger, the less Spanish they know how to speak. So I know how to speak the most, and then my brother's the second, and then, you know, it kind of goes goes down the the range like that, which is a really common Latin American experience. And talk to me about the arts. Like, how did that happen? Was your mother or your stepfather involved in any way? Were they artists? No, not at all. My, my dad owned a sign company, and uh, my mom would waitress and help out with that. And I mean, and with four kids who did the really hard and just worthy uh, job of raising children, which is, I don't know, now that my friends are having kids, I'm like, whoa. I'm like, I forgive you for everything because I'm still alive. I don't know how to <laughs> keep four, four kids alive. And oh. Two of them are 10 months apart. And I'm just like, I, I, I would just give up. Um, I have a, my cat and that's hard enough. I'm surprised he's still alive. Uh, but, <laughs> you know. And so were you, were you in, when you were in high school, were you getting involved in the drama program at all? Yeah, I, I did get involved in the drama program as an elective. I, uh, when I was really young uh, in our church youth group and we would do kind of church plays and we'd go to shopping malls and perform Christmas musicals. And uh, I was Tina Tinsel, I was the tinsel on the tree. Yeah. And I had, you know, it was just stuff like that. It was always something that I really enjoyed and something that I felt that I was good at. Uh, but I don't know, it wasn't always something that I thought I'd pursue as a career. I think part of me, if I'm really honest, did, but I think giving myself that agency and giving myself the ability to say, yes, this is what I'm gonna do. And getting past the look in people's eyes when you say, oh, I'm an actor. And they're like, oh, what, what are you, you in? How's it, yeah. how's it going for you? And you're yeah. Like, yeah, you know, because I think with, with a lot of other art forms, I mean, as a musician, you can write music. And yeah. as a writer, you can, you know, write, or as a painter, you paint. But as an actor, you're kind of just alone in a room talking to yourself. Or waiting so for someone to give you an opportunity or to say it's, yeah. it's Michelle's turn, you know? But what's nice about now, which I think is a really special moment, is that we are able to create our own audiences and to start creating our own material. And I think that that's something that hasn't, I mean, in the history of the world, I don't think you, an artist has had such just vast access to uh, viewership or to people, I mean, just consumers in, of art in any way yeah. uh, than ever. So I think that there's something really, really great about this specific time, specifically for actors to be able to, you know, create your own stuff. Totally. And talk to me, because I know we're relatively close to the same age. I know at a moment there, you know, Universal Orlando had content going and Miami had like, you know, a lot of Michael Bay films and there were some things mm -hmm. shooting there. Did you get involved in, in any of that kind of film industry in Florida? No, I did commercials, but I'd always kind of done commercials as like extra money yeah. and done, you know, a few things here and there. But, it, you know, it's interesting. It's like the difference between treating it like a hobby and treating it like a career. Yeah. So I feel like for so much of it, it was always kind of a hobby. It was something I would, you know, be in my friend's movies and uh think I was doing things to move in the direction but it really is a different thing when you really treat it like a career and you treat it as like as an entrepreneur where it's not just uh oh I like to act and let me just go out you're just actively moving towards towards a, a career and you know if you were to start a restaurant or if you were to start a you know, a, a, rest, a store or anything, you would look at things a certain way. And I think as actors, sometimes uh, it's easy to kind of feel like, oh, I'm just like a talent and I'm doing this. And, and there is that aspect of it, but like, it's also like, are you working on your product, which is your craft yeah. and maybe even like your body. And it isn't so much like you need to be like buff, but like just really kind of, this is our, our tools 
So making sure even like that you're getting, like giving yourself massages or just, you know, different things to yeah. kind of uh, prepare yourself to, totally. to, and even just the act of taking care of yourself, I think is a, is a really great exercise to have. And, and obviously you're an incredibly beautiful woman. And I know there's a bumbling modeling scene in Miami. Did that, like, did that, did people try to get you to do some, I know you did commercial work, but modeling gigs, yeah. was that something you got involved in and with at all? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, honestly, at the point it was anything that would get me a little extra money. I mean, I would, you know, if I was like, the girl in the box of the Sony uh, camera ad, like whatever it was, I yeah. would do it. And it was always, you know, it's like a way to make some extra money that uh, you might not get to make if if you were doing something else, you know? So yeah, I definitely, I did whatever would pay. I, really. Hey, I did the same I ate thing. a lot of burgers. <laughs> I, ate a, I drank, a, drank some Starbucks and was like, all right. And then but I, mean, I think in a lot of ways, like those corporations can be like the Medici's of our generation, the Catholic church. There's always somebody that's like providing the money so that the artists can do what they need to do. And right now, you know, that's just kind of the way that it is. Like I can either work at a Starbucks or I could, you know, do a Starbucks ad. Yeah, totally. And then I know a lot of people that grew up in like cosmopolitan cities like Miami or New York or LA, sometimes they get stuck there because like, you know, they know it well. Talk to me about, you know, the post high school decision. Where did you see yourself? Because I, I imagine New York was kind of, you know, if you had modeling and commercials, you could have yeah. done that. Like talk to me about the decision to go to LA. I, I came to visit a friend and I actually, I um, had a roommate when I was on South Beach and I was like, oh, I'm going to go to LA for a month. And there was a part of me that kind of like was like, maybe I'll just move there. And it was very responsible. I'm very lucky that my friend still talked to me because I came out here for what I thought was going to be a month. And I, you know, had some kind of met a group of girlfriends and they had gotten a house, uh, like kind of off Laurel Canyon above the Sunset Strip. Oh, and beautiful. They were all, they're like, hey, like, do you want to rent half of a room? for a few hundred bucks and I was just kind of like yeah okay and I got like a I did the same I lived on a couch <laughs> yeah yeah so I shared a bed with I shared a bed with uh three different people at three different times so that was, <laughs> oh my god you know you do what you gotta do to, yeah. to get to where you need to be sometimes um and we you know I it, it was something that I didn't even tell my roommate at home that I was doing and I just was like oh it'll just be an extra month and I just kind of kept not going home. And- uh, Like you and, kept re yeah. renewing every month, you would stay another month? I would stay another month. And then in my mind, I was like, oh, maybe I'll go back and forth between both places. But like, that was never gonna happen. I didn't have the yeah. money to do that. I yeah, don't know what I was totally. thinking. But it was, uh, you know, just naivete and irresponsibility sometimes. Oh, uh, I it had was, the same I thing. Think, I think it was just kind of really just, not wanting to go home and yeah. I couldn't really explain it and I just I stuck around and then I spent a summer in New York with a friend and it was just I don't know it, it it was I was very lost in a lot of ways and I think in my mind I would say things like oh yeah I'm, I'm gonna act but there really is a difference between doing it as a career and as a hobby and kind of going from amateur to pro and I think that it took a while for me to have the confidence to really do that. Me about like, were you assimilating? Sorry, one second here. I'm dealing with a audio issue. Just fix this. Sorry about this. Rolo, can you hear my audio? Ro? Uh oh. Yeah, what's up? My audio, my Yeti just came. Sorry. That's okay. I mean, I'm. I'm hearing you. I just want to make sure I have the proper mic. Sure. And do, do, do. All right, are you hearing me now? Uh, me? Yeah. yeah, can you hear me? Does it sound better? Yeah. Okay, cool, the Yeti came undone. Oh, hold on, it just cut out again. I'm I'm not hearing you, Ryan. Check, 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 check. Better. Yeah, now you're back. All right, cool. All Just right. Yell. 
<laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no, no worries. Yeah. But I'm then, not going anywhere. <laughs> so then talk to me about like <laughs> assimilating into LA. Did you feel the need to go to a conservatory or like? No, honestly, I wish like, I really wish that there was like, and then I did the XYZ thing because I, I really spent a lot of time, like quite a few years, just not really knowing what I was doing or how I was doing it. I was kind of working and then I'd like hang out with friends and then I would like say I was like taking things seriously, but then I didn't. And it was, it really, uh, I feel like I'm very lucky that things worked out, but there was, um, I really, I, I, I just, I spent some time lost. Like I didn't really know how I was going to do things or where I was, what I was even doing. And I think yeah. I really did. I remember quitting my job because at some point I realized, so I uh, went in with a friend of mine to drop off. He was dropping off something for his commercial agent. They were a huge commercial agency. They offered me to represent me, which was great because then I was doing commercials while I was kind of working. Were you doing the classic waitressing hospitality or? Yeah, yeah. I worked at a, a hotel. And the I Roosevelt, remember, right? Mm hmm. The Roosevelt Hotel. And what's that and, like? Because you're in the epicenter of Hollywood and celebrities are coming in. Like, did that feel weird yeah. to kind of be in this business and then seeing all these people? But, you know, you're kind of still figuring yourself out. Yeah, I mean, it was really fun. And it was, I mean, I, you know, was making decent money. And then I was very, yeah, it was just, it was just a fun scene to be a part of. So I think it makes it easy for, you know, weeks to turn into months to turn into, you know, a year or two. And then all of a sudden being like, what have I done with this yeah. last, these last few years? And I that kind of being identify. okay. Yeah, and I think sometimes we're really hard on ourselves, but sometimes those experiences kind of give you things to lean on when when you're acting I mean those are our tools as well those experiences and I know that I use those now well I think it shows and, your work and make you have life to pull from you know I mean yeah you're very beautiful but there's a depth to you and a lot mm -hmm. of actors are able to, to, to just dig into it and skate on their looks but it sounds like you live your life and it is frustrating as it can be to be I could have I should have I would have I mean, it really shows in your work and there's such a depth to your work. And, and I think, you know, as hard as it may have been, I, I'm really glad it worked out the way it did. Yeah, I mean, and I think it, you know, we kind of talk about sometimes like people are like, oh, how close to your character are you? And I'm like, I really relate to Lynn. <laughs> I relate to Lynn's journey, that idea of, or that ability to kind of float around and kind of have not no follow not well yeah I would say no follow through you know and really making that decision to finally follow through on something yeah and that I, I really relate to that journey and how powerful that can be at whatever stage in your life that you do that in because it really is it's a worthy and courageous thing to do is to kind of move into that space and 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 be kind to yourself. You know, you're gonna fall back. Yeah. You're going to fail, but that doesn't mean you're a failure. You, uh, you, you just keep going. And that's like only oh, like the biggest advice I can give people is, I don't know how or when or whatever, but you literally just keep going. Yeah. And I always, I I mean, even though like they people tell you things and you think, like you know love is within or whatever but then one day it like hits you and you're like love is within it yeah. just like kind of hits you in that way and I remember feeling that way with like just with acting it's like you the most important thing you can do is bring yourself to it and know that who you are is enough like because a lot of times acting we kind of come into it or it's easy to be like oh I want to be this person that or get some sort of validation that I never had but the reality is, is when you get to where you think you need to go every single insecurity every single weird funky feeling that you have comes with you and if anything it amplifies because now you're not anonymous when you walk into yeah. a room like people are aware of your work you're seeing it there's a tangible thing that people can pick apart if it comes down to it and it's just how 
important it is to really show up with your authenticity, whatever that is, because that is what's going to be the most important part of your, of your journey is like really leaning into whatever that is. And it's going to make you different from other people. Totally. And I'm curious, were you, were you working a lot commercially? I was. Yeah. I mean, I don't say a lot. Yeah. I was working enough commercially. I was working enough where I could, uh, where I could pay my bills and, you know, I wasn't like buying any houses or like going on vacations to Hawaii, but yeah. I was like, you know, paying my rent and kind of just, just enough. And where were your parents and your siblings at? Were they supportive of this or were they trying to get you to come home at any moment? Cause I know it can be, you know, when the, pe- the yeah. path of artists, you know, nobody gets creativity and the, and the desire to do something that what appears to most people to be a really selfish and ridiculous thing, but as yeah. artists, it's our job to create. So talk to me about that. Were you, were you, were you so buoyed in LA with, you know, your, your friends and your work and, and the commercials? I, I'm, my family has been, for the most part, I would say like, there was a lot of support there. I mean, I'd book a Ford commercial and I'd go home and my mom would like pull up the Ford commercial to people that she was introducing <laughs> me to. And I'd be like, mom, 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 that's not my dream. Like the Ford commercial is not my dream. <laughs> yeah, totally. And she's like, she's so successful, you know? And um, so that's kind of hysterical. And I think, in an interesting way, I feel like a lot of people believed in me before even I did. Yeah. And I feel really lucky for that. I think there were many times where people pulled me aside and was like, you need to be acting. You need to be doing this. This is something that you're good at and really seeing that. I mean, I even worked with this um, this acting coach, Marjorie Ballantyne, who uh, studied directly under Stella Adler. Stella gave her, kind of made, left a lot of her legacy within her. She was like her protege. And, you know, she really supported me when she was just like, just come to my class. I want you to work. I was like, I don't know if I have the money for that. And she was like, I just want you to work. I will like take care of it. And having those people believe in you, I think is, is really, really, really special. And I really believe more than ever that just, you don't have space for people that don't, aren't supportive of you and aren't going to really honor the journey, even the ups and downs. Like when you're really struggling, aren't going to be like, you got this, Yeah, you do. Because it's just, it's just not worth it. Totally. You know, you can't have people around you that aren't, that are going to try to like, move you away from the the just the song in your heart where yeah. which is what you want because sometimes it's squawking and it doesn't sound beautiful or whatever <laughs> yeah. but like we, and so it's just like and I and the, and the thing is like I still feel it I mean if I'm completely honest I I for sure the first season and then the second season I was convinced I needed to quit acting because I was like oh my gosh I've ruined the show it's so it's so bad this is really embarrassing I should quit and then having friends be like no yeah you're fine you're the anchor but feeling so ripped apart and so kind of just like I I I don't know like was that and then kind of eventually just realizing now oh this is this thing that I do so I'm going to hear the voice and have to as opposed to being like don't be that way kind of embracing that shadow self that little like kissing the beast a little bit and realizing okay this is a part of like the weird stuff that Michelle does is that after shooting something especially if it's very vulnerable you almost get like this vulnerability hangover where you're just like I don't know I don't know and it's really you just protecting yourself and and being like all right well that may or may not go away but we're all all the insecurities all the confidence everything is hopping in the car and heading in this direction so we're all just gonna go and it doesn't go away but the main thing is just be kind to yourself and let yourself experience what you're experiencing was there a moment in la when you're like i need to get into some legit work because you're in the behemoth of the industry and i'm sure you had all these commercials did you go to your agent and be like hey can you can you get me some television film auditions i couldn't get well i would say like it's not like i tried like a like I wasn't like knocking down every door, but 
I got a manager and um, the manager uh, kind of set up a few agency meetings and I just, you know, I heard like, oh, we already have one ethnically ambiguous person on our roster, so we can't really take another one on yeah. or, um, you know, just all sorts of kind of things that at some point I was just like, you know what? Fuck I'm gonna you. see if I can <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm just yeah. like I, or or being like, oh, let's I think we forget also like the power that we have. Yeah. Uh, if you are confident in your work and that's your biggest thing, that's something you can do on your own. What you yeah. know, you work, watch things, read things also because everything that you do is fueling that ability pretty much that basket for you to draw upon yeah. and connecting you to something greater than yourself which is just this like muse essentially yeah. so it's get there really fill yourself with with that go out and have life experiences go take a walk in nature and 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 do that so that when you're walking into a room you're walking into a room saying this is who I am not this is who I'm not yeah because nothing repels like even just think of dating, you know, like you don't want to be with somebody who doesn't want to be with themselves, yeah. who doesn't like themselves. So when you're walking into a room with that stench, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a repelling. And, and he being, I mean, I had to, I had an agent be like, you know what, we'll, we'll give it a shot. And I was just like, oh, I would never date somebody that said, well, I'll give you a shot. And I yeah. said, well, I, I, you're either really excited about me or you're not. And yeah. I didn't have enough credit to really be doing that, but I was yeah. just like, no. So I were you I simultaneously was, actor at accessing hustle yourself and like yeah, yeah I would do I was doing actors access and just stuff kind of on my own um, and then I w with my manager uh, I remember saying like let's just let's just I was like I think let's just give it a year because he was get, also getting me a lot of auditions and I was like I feel like I'm gonna book my own series. And then I'll have like stuff on the table to kind of like negotiate. With. Yeah, totally. So my first agent was UTA. Like that was my first wow. agent. But, you know, not for not taking meetings with other people and trying to get smaller stuff. It just wasn't. And I just kind of in my mind was like, you know what? I'm going to wait till I can be with somebody really great who's really excited about yeah. it. And, you know, luck obviously has something to do with it, but also being prepared for the luck because I was, um, I had gotten back into acting classes and, and um well even before that though i um what was it the fear the walking dead Passage. was doing a digital yes it was doing a digital series but they went through commercial agents because they were kind of trying to go around like the fans and just certain things so i went in for the audition not knowing that it was going to be like a full monologue of stuff and usually when they're like, oh, have for commercial auditions, or you're like, oh, have the, the, the stuff prepared. Yeah. It's like, I like ice cream, you like ice cream, let's go eat ice cream. You know, like it's not anything, like the sides aren't anything that intense. But when I got there, they it was like two pages worth oh of essentially God. a monologue. And I was just like, what is this? And they wanted like, you to call and read it? Well, I was supposed to have it prepared, but I didn't realize that it was like a two-page monologue. I, yeah. I, I kind of thought that it was just going to be like normal commercial like, audition, commercial stuff. Yeah. But at that point, I was like, I got this. Like, Tell I don't a story know. about your favorite jacket or something, you know. Yeah. yeah and yeah. at this point, I'd like had done so much of it at that point and I was like you know doing well that I was just like whatever and then I was just like whoa this is why is she crying and then like happy and then and then I realized well I was like is this a Zoloft commercial like why is she crying <laughs> <laughs> like it seems like her husband or her like boyfriend like used to abuse her like what what type of commercial is this yeah totally and he he was just like it's not uh he's like it's not a Zola commercial it's not this he's like but I guarantee you'll be really happy if you book it and I was like ah okay and they were they gave given me the opportunity to maybe work on it a little bit and then come back after lunch but it was in Santa Monica and if anybody knows anything about LA I lived in Echo Park and oh no two hours way. yeah <laughs> I was gonna wait till after lunch and have to drive back at five o'clock so I was like you know what give me just like 15 minutes let me just see what I can do I don't even know what this is maybe it's yeah. nothing great anyways and I kind of read it a few times and I felt it in my body I was like, let's do it. And I just was like, 
all right. And I did it and it just all kind of was coming and it was like these great moments and, and, you know, I got a call back and I still didn't know what it was. And then I got another one and then I got uh, told that I booked it, but I still had no idea what it was until the wardrobe people called and they're like, we're calling from Fear the Walking Dead to, you know, get your sizes and all this stuff. And I was like, oh, I booked like this short form series. It was the first time working with uh, Andrew Bernstein who, you know, did Ozark and Pan Am. And it was like, yeah. I was like, wow, these are really great uh actors like mike mosley from ozark and i love mike uh, yeah oh, he's so, so good and kelsey scott who'd been 12 years a slave and she's insecure so this was my first time doing that and i was just like oh my gosh this is crazy but it was wow. really fun and and then it, it that kind of led to that, that uh, the, introduced um, you to carmen cuba right yes yeah the, it the did best. i She's she's a very 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 special casting director yeah. for sure. I mean, she cares so much, has really great taste, and really works with actors and like kind of takes chances on people. And I think that that's yeah, like, you know, that, it's that's a rarity. How as, to be a casting director. director? Yeah, totally. Yeah, and then that that led to Vita, right? Yeah, yeah, because the short form series got nominated for uh, Creative Arts Emmy, and uh, I got to go to the Emmy Awards. Creative Arts Emmy Awards and uh, sit third row center. I thought we were going to, because it was a short form series, I was like, they were just going to sit us in the back. Somewhere. Yeah. They, so I snuck in all the champagne. So I was like, <laughs> we're going to drink, we're we're gonna gonna drink champagne in the yeah. back. And then cut to like me sitting like by like, you know, Joseph Gordon Lovett and like all these like people. And I'm, and, like, Tom, I'm like, that's Tom Hanks. Like, wow, okay, here I am. And I'm like, I have all these like champagne that I snuck in. So, <laughs> it's embarrassing. It's amazing. It's the only way you should have done it. And then was Vita at that point, because I imagine you had some traction, was, was that an audition or was that an offer or? Oh God, I would, uh, no, definitely not an offer. It was, uh, it was a self tape. And then it was uh, audition, producer session. I tested for it. I didn't get it. And I really thought that uh, I thought like I was like oh I'm gonna be on this show like I just like felt it but then I was like oh but this is like what you talk about like actor crushes yeah where you're like yes like this is my show and then you don't book it and your heart gets broken oh um, so it was an interesting thing and I don't know where this came from I really really don't because when I found out that I didn't get it I was like you know what I tested for something and this is just like my second, like real, yeah. like my second pilot season or second year of like really getting, I've been trying for, for at, least at that point, like five, uh, about five years, I guess, six years maybe. Um, but at that, that point that had been like my second, like proper year of like auditioning for real things. Yeah. And, um, and then I was like, I tested for something and I'm just going to like really honor myself for like that. As like, you should, something. yeah. And, and it, I wasn't, I mean, I was, a, I did cry, but it was like, kind of like this, like, more, like, kind of like, okay, like, I'm going to let this pass be something I really wanted. And then um, I, it wasn't until, I want to say it was like maybe a week later, they called me in and had me test again, essentially test again for, uh, to, to, for a recast for the lead. And you were I, up for a different character before? Yeah, I was going. I was going in for Cruz, which was the love interest. Oh, and I, you know, tested for it, and and I didn't get it. And and so I chemistry read, you know, with the actor that had uh, shot the original pilot presentation, and you know, I was like, oh, maybe it just like wasn't a good chemistry or whatever it was. And then uh, about a week and a half later, I mean, I was, I think it was like a week and a half, week, week and a half. Uh, I got a call that said they want to, uh, the, the showrunner wants to meet with you uh, possibly for another series regular. And I'm like, this show shoots in a few weeks. They're not just like writing a new series regular. And, yeah. and I was like, I was like, is it a recast? They're like, it's absolutely not a recast. <laughs> and I was like, okay. So then I got like side sent to me the night before I was supposed to meet with the showrunner. And I was like, am I supposed to know this? Yeah. But I kind of, but I didn't have a character breakdown or anything like that. So I read the sides and I was like, this sounds like an Emma, 
but maybe they're just sending me sides just to see what I do. Yeah, how the generic sides that they do in auditions now. Yeah, yeah so I made all the wrong choices. Like I made a character that definitely was not Emma. And then in the room, they kind of were directing me in a certain way. And then as I was in there doing it, I was like, oh, this is a recast. And I hadn't prepared for that character at all. So yeah. it was oh, and they told you the it wasn't, you know? And then being redirected in the room into that character and having someone like Tanya Saracho and Robin Schwartz is um, the, uh, you know, the head of TV for Big Beach who produces Viva and uh, Stephanie Langhoff, which is a producer as well. And they directed me into that character, which is, you know, I feel like it's, it's, it's luck, but it's also being prepared for it. Because yeah. if I hadn't kind of been in that space, I wouldn't have been able to be directed into that character. Totally. And, and then, yeah. And then, you know, the next morning I, well, that night, all the writers on Vida you know, started following me on Instagram. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like I'm sorry. Yeah. And I called my manager and he's like, well, we don't know what it means. Maybe they just look like he was an actor. Like, don't. And I was like, okay. Don't read into and it. Then, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and then the next morning I, I got the call that I, that I had booked it. And, and talk, talk to me about that moment. Like, how did that feel? It was interesting because I was, I was helping somebody self-tape. And they were doing a really great job. And I saw my phone ring, but I was I didn't want to mess up their salt tape, so I just kind of <laughs> let it go. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> and I was like, uh, no, don't worry, everything's fine. So we're, we're doing that. And then my friend, uh, who we were both helping this other guy salt tape, uh, she, uh, she knew my manager and he knew we were together and he called her and I guess texted her. And she was like, Kind of whispered to me she's like I think you need to take that call and I was like okay I like walked out of the room and I took the call and my manager was like I want to congratulate you on booking your first tv show and oh my god I was like and she kind of came out afterwards because you know they finished the take and she came out and I just kind of was like sitting there and strangely enough like I didn't react that strongly I was kind of like thank you and I just kind of smiled and she looked at me and she was like yes and I was like yeah and then she started crying and I was just like whoa this is a big was, deal yeah and the most fun part about it was getting to tell a few of like my close friends that I'd known for a really long time like I was gonna go out to dinner with a friend of mine and I was like let's go my, my best friend she's also my creative partner Jesse Hill and we went to we were gonna go to dinner and you know you get ready and I was like yeah. oh, I'm gonna bring over a bottle of champagne and she's like, yeah, like, while we get ready. And I like bought like the nicest bottle of champagne I could afford. And I went over and I was like, oh, will you open up the bottle of champagne for us? And she was like, yeah, yeah. And she like wouldn't open it. And then eventually she went and got it and she looked at it and she was like, this is a really nice bottle of champagne. And she looked at me and I went, mm. <laughs> and she <started> <laughs> That's amazing. And I was like, I was not, I don't know why, I just was kind of like, okay, like, it was almost like, we're here, like, this is, yeah. this makes sense, this is how it goes, and it didn't really hit me until, I want to say a few days later, I had to go to the Warner Brother lot to, uh, to do a fitting yeah. for the character, and um, there's that iconic tower, the water tower, the Warner oh, Brothers yeah. water the tower, back. yeah. And I, this is so ridiculous, but I, um, I grew up watching Animaniacs. Oh, of course, me too. too. Yeah. And I was, I was walking, I was crossing the street and I look up and I see the water tower. And in my mind, I was like, Wacko, Yakko and Dot live in there. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to work right now. Yeah. I don't know what it was, this like funny little thing. And it was just bawling tears. Like oh. as I was like on the corner of the lot, just like somehow connecting that to my childhood and yeah. that iconic image and just being like, honey, you're going to work right now. And I was like, oh, it, it, people on the street are like, she must have had a bad audition. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> <laughs> it's the opposite. Like, yeah. <laughs> 
and then talk to me about day one. You show up on this huge set and you got a trailer with your name on it. How did that feel, you know? Yeah, it was it was fun. I mean, we did a, a bunch of rehearsals and, you know, the uh, woman who plays my sister, Melissa Barrera, like yes, we had great. such a great time. Did you, it, did you guys do a chemistry read or no? No, I honestly, like they took, I did not have enough credits for them to know that I could do that. I, yeah. even at the end of, I think the second season, I, I went up to Robin Schwartz, who is, you know, the head of TV for Big Beach. And I remember telling her, I'm like, thank you for taking a chance on me. And she was like, honey, I'm not in the business of taking chances. <laughs> I know what I know when I see it. And yeah. because it was, you know, it was that. And I, I just, you know, you just kind of, you're like, all right, let's get to work. We had rehearsed it. And my main thing was like, I know that the chemistry between these two young women is going to be really, really important between the sisters. And I, and so I was like, I want to hang out with Melissa. Let's go. We had like this epic wild night together. Uh, Halloween, we just like were out till God knows what time, but it was like, <laughs> it was fun because it created this like real energy between us. And yeah. She's a really, really, really special person. And I'm so grateful to, um, to uh, have gotten to work with her. Cause you know, both of us, it was a, it was a, a big moment for both of us and yeah. her first uh, TV show in the United States and my first TV show ever. So we showed up and the first scene we shot is um, in season one, there's a walking scene right after Emma and Lynn find out that the, the more traditional Mexican mother was married to a woman. And now, Oh, oh I know. Yeah. 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 That was the first scene we, we shot. And it was, you know, kind of like, all right, do I have it? Do I have it? Do I have it? I don't know. Like, is this character in me? And, and just, but just pushing, pushing it and going. And then we shot the taco scene where, uh, so it was, you know, there were these really great kind of movement scenes to get to shoot. Yeah. Uh, and, and yeah, I don't know. It was, it was, um, just those moments, you know, where you're just like, wow, like we're here and you're working. Yeah. Um, and getting to do something special too. It felt really special from the beginning. And I, I bring this up because I just had the cast of this show, Normal People On, and there's mm. a lot of intimate scenes there. Talk to me about yeah. the intimacy in that show. Was that something, did you, did you know about or, you know, you were told about? Like, I, I, I know that can be really vulnerable for an actor. Yeah, I mean, we all knew. It was very clear, must be comfortable. With me. I mean, every single series regular um, even a lot of the recurring characters, um, there was definitely that where we knew. I, for myself, I mean, I watched a lot of like French film and kind of foreign film. So for me, it, it, nudity was never off the table for me. It yeah. was always just for the right project or if it made sense. Um, so it was, it was always something that I figured I'd do eventually. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I, this obviously, these scenes are very intense, but I also feel like there's something really important about what those scenes symbolize as well. Yeah, I totally. think also two brown queer women enjoying themselves and yeah. kind of exploring their, um, their interior emotional anatomy through not only the way that they navigate uh, you know, just life, but part of how you navigate life is sometimes through your sexual experience. Yeah. And seeing, revealing less, less about revealing skin and more about revealing emotion and intimacy. Totally. And how these women deal with that. Yeah. And control. Yeah. And then you got three seasons out of that show. How, how does I it know. feel that now it's, you know, sadly come to an end? Was that just such a beautiful ride you know i imagine it was a it was a roller coaster getting it and then through it yeah. you know it was you know where we would have obviously loved to have continued on but uh three seasons off of a show and a show like this is is definitely something to be proud of and we yeah. really, really are and we know that it's more than just the show it's about hopefully the other doors that will open and now we have these characters out in the Hollywood world. So you have 
um, Mari played by Chelsea Rendon, like La Pinja Chinche, you have, yeah. you know, Ferran Zategui playing Eddie, like those characters exist. You have an Emma who is a businesswoman and Latina and, and queer, uh, that is something that is an, we don't always get to portray characters that way oh, totally. that are flawed and, and, but yet still have this kind of core that you kind of get and understand and I think with Lynn she has a similar thing where you realize what it's like to be you know second third generation immigrant families and where that goes where how quickly you can assimilate to the dominant culture yeah. and almost like allow yourself to be fetishized as a totally. Latina and like those themes aren't usually discussed yeah and and it's very human and well fleshed out in a I'm curious to ask you, you know, now that there's kind of been this huge push for, you know, better female characters as it should be mm -hmm. and, and, and persons of color, do you feel like the content has gotten better and the auditions, like, are you, are you proud of, of where it's headed or do you think there's still a long way to go? There's definitely still a long way to go. I mean, we've been kind of, there's nothing new under the sun. It's just our turn. Like we've been moving in this direction for years and years and years you look back even you know obviously we're discussing acting right now but you think of Dolores Huerta back to like labor unions and, yeah. and and even now just fighting for equal pay as like a as a yeah a Latina woman that is there's there's a lot of work to be done but if we can move it in the right direction for Latina women, for queer women, for women of color. Yeah. Uh, I think we all benefit from that. This isn't just us benefiting from it. It's, it's I think the world benefits us. from it, you exactly. know? Yeah, it makes everyone equal, exactly. as, as it says in the Declaration of Independence. Yeah. <laughs> like that's what America should represent. And yeah. It, and even if we can move it just a tiny bit in the direction, then the next generation can take it and we make the world just a little totally. bit easier for each other and, and a little bit easier for us to feel seen and comfortable. And, and that's the most important thing. And I think that we really do benefit in seeing the world as it is. We're not creating something that doesn't already, uh, we're not trying to represent something that doesn't already exist in the world. Like we, yeah. we, these people are, you know, these communities and stuff like that. They, we all deserve for our story to be told. Totally. And then, and I'm curious to ask you, you know, tonally that show has one very specific tone and then you jump into Riverdale, which yeah. has a completely different tone. And these yeah. are my words, not your, you know, not yours. I want to be very careful here. You know, it's a show that is campy intentionally. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of, performances that are grounded and not grounded and I loved your character because you really brought truth to a show where it can be really hard to do that you know what was it like switching up into that world you know it was so fun I mean that was uh one where they wrote and offered the role to me oh no way. something yeah oh that's so beautiful so, that was really fun. Um, I mean, pretty much my deal signed on Friday and by, I think that Sunday I was on a plane and shooting, I think on Monday or Tuesday. Wow. Uh, so yeah, I, I mean, that show is just so fun. I mean, Emma really ripped it out of me, Yeah. but uh, I get to really play with this femme fatale archetype. Totally. And, and find the truth and humanity in her, but also just have fun because I also I was a huge fan of Archie comics growing up so oh really yeah. like, oh like it was the only comic book that I was obsessed with so I collected them and I loved Archie comics so when the opportunity came for me to come on to it I originally I think it was only going to be a few episodes and they kept adding episodes to yeah the, you got like 10 or 9 or yeah. yeah yeah so it was and it's just yeah it's been really fun um you know Camilla Mendez and uh you know Mark Consuelo like they're such great people to work with and we just have a lot of fun on the set and that's kind of nice and it plays with this kind of 
Lynchian aspect as well. Totally. That allows you to kind of move into spaces of hyper reality and yeah. stuff that is like Twin somewhat P, unbelievable. Sobra. Yeah, totally. Yeah, and so that essentially was a challenge for me when I think yeah. of think of that, and and I was willing to do it because it was just a fun challenge to get to be a part of. And I really also love what I love what Roberto is doing with the the genre. The genre yeah as well because i think he's normalizing a lot of stuff that normally would uh you know whether it's with like uh race or lgbtqi plus representation yeah. there's a lot that's kind of happening there that in creating this world just was like normal yeah. and allowing the characters in this archie universe to actually have diversity within this 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 universe for these characters um so I, I am a, I'm a big fan of Roberto's and what, yeah. what he's doing with the genre and doing with essentially a teen drama and having fun with it and not being scared to take risks. Sometimes it, it you know, you get, you get a hit show that ends up being this global sensation yeah. and it's easy to kind of just keep doing the same thing, but he kind of yeah. takes risks. And if, even if it's like, Oh, that was a little weird. Yeah. Like, oh, well. Like, yeah, it's totally. Great. It's like a, a, a band. A Every record should be different because that's how you get better as a band and mm -hmm. explore your musical horizons. And yeah. is it true you have an art collective? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm a part of one. Unfortunately, because I've gotten so busy, we haven't gotten to do something in a while, but it's a Dama Rosa uh, Art Collective. And, you know, I think that is a testimony to what we're talking about before when you're acting and you don't have you're not getting a job that tells you you're an actor here's a stamp you still are an artist and yeah. uh that was an opportunity for us to really come together i have such amazing friends and female artists that i really respect that i'm close to so we would take a, a piece of literature uh the first zine was um anaya Smin, little birds and each of us would assign each other a chapter and then have to reinterpret the chapter based off of whatever artistic medium was. So I did with my creative partner, Jesse Hill, we did kind of little short films, performance art short films. Yeah. Uh, other artists did weaving, painting, sculptures, uh, all sorts of things like that. And then we, uh, I think the first show was on the Lower East Side in New York City. The second one was in Venice in LA. And we just did a lot of that where you'd kind of go into the space and essentially you'd experience the book reinterpreted by other women. Totally. Uh, and their art mediums. I think the second book was Rachel Carlson's uh, Silent Spring, yeah. which was a book that was, you know, she's pretty much the person that kind of blew the whistle on the fact that pesticides might not be great, but at yeah. the time, people it was so crazy that she was saying that and they kind of discredited her and now when we look back on the book she was right about a lot of stuff so we wow. reinterpreted those things but yeah so it it's just keeping yourself fed and busy doing things with each other whatever that may be so we so that our collective we'd also like meet and have dinners and just really kind of exchange exchange ideas and Britt Bogan who was the is the um painter and artist that uh essentially started we we're all founding members but she started it uh i mean we still collaborate and work on a lot of stuff together like little music videos here and there and photos and just you know just kind of getting to express yourself through ways that aren't just here's your job go act on set i love that well, a couple of final questions for you, because I, I know you have other interviews today. Like, I spoke about this with Carla Gugino and Kathleen Turner when they were on the show. And I know being a beautiful woman as yourself, you know, can be a blessing and it can be a curse. So now that you've had this collective, do you have any interest in producing to maybe get yourself some other roles that could be a little bit more arduous to get through, you know, the normal acting mm -hmm. audition channels? Yeah, I definitely, a, a passion of mine is to move into producing stuff. And I think that's also part of the, 
the movement of us being able to tell our own stories and be in a position to to do that so that is definitely something that i want to do and also move into like the writing space i've written you, a few things here direct? There, but you know a lot of people keep encouraging me to do that i don't know if i'm ready i don't know if my heart kind of is moving in that direction yet but producing and writing i definitely 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 feel really i love that passionate about and and then you know just creating opening the door so that we can bring people with us because it's easy to walk through the door and just shut it behind you and i think that it's time for us to really start you you know you move into a space how many people can you bring with you yeah and more than ever I, I think that it's time for us to start being doing that more that's amazing so beautiful and then i'm curious you know for those actors listening out there the the young michelle's uh, maybe in miami or or in missouri and or in la you know any advice you you would give to your younger self or to those younger actors that haven't got an agent or a commercial mm -hmm. or a show yet like i know that's a a very loaded question, but any, any words of advice? So I used to do this really funny thing where, and, and I don't know if this is like a major advice or anything like that, but I know that in a weird way, this kind of helped me where I would imagine myself as like the older, more, I mean, I hesitate to say successful, but maybe like where I want to be. Yeah, you see your future self. Retelling the story that I'm going through now. So, oh, I worked in this hotel and you know what? There was like these weeks where I would go and I would cry and I didn't know and I didn't, but then it ended up this. And then, you know, I would remember, I would almost like everything that I was going through, I would retell it as this older version of me oh, because wow. it kept me really connected to where I was going and realizing everything that we experience is a tale that we will tell. Yeah. And it's all leading us to exactly where we're meant to be. And if you know where you're going, you don't freak out when you have to stop for gas. Totally. It may be stressful. Maybe you run out of gas on the side of the road and you have to have like, you know, Bubba on the truck, pick you up and take you wherever. Yeah. It is, but it all ends up being this kind of juicy story that you get to tell when you yeah. get to where you're at. So now I'm here with you and I'm telling you the story of me being lost, not knowing what to do, living on a bed with like, you know, like share, like paying for half of a room essentially yeah. and all that stuff. And in those moments, remembering that there's going to be a me now telling that yeah. story. Yeah. and that this too shall, uh, shall change that that has always kind of stuck with me so even if it's like the happiest moment that you're experiencing yeah. it may not last so that long so like enjoy it for what it is or if it's a horrible moment sit in that like allow yourself to experience emotions and don't run from it because essentially those are the tools that we use yeah or roles but to to not feel so like you not no one moment defines you, no one role defines you, no one day defines you. So if you have a bad day, tomorrow's another one. Like really allowing yourself to kind of trust like the the journey of it and that yeah. it all kind of is leading you exactly where you need to be. Yeah. And I, be be comfortable with that because you meet you know, because it's like, okay, I know I'm going gonna freak out every moment that like I get traffic or that I move into like I, I oh I'm got off on the wrong lines but whatever it is like just get back on just keep going yeah I love that I've never heard anyone oh, articulate that way <laughs> that's so beautiful and then fi final question what's next for Michelle do you have any I mean I know the industry right now same for me is at a pause but do you have any idea of what's next for you well, you're looking at me sitting on my couch. Which is what I've been doing. Oh, wow. I'm in my bedroom. So. Yes. Yeah. And it's actually, you know, I, I think there's moments of, of enjoying actually having some time off. Uh, there's, I mean, the last few years of my life have been crazy. I didn't realize it as much until I had this time off. Yeah. I think there's also sometimes anxiety with like just what's going on in the world and 
really wanting to help and doing the best that we can and, and supporting yeah. the people that are really on the front lines of, of this really, really wild time. But yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we cut season four of Riverdale short. So I'm thinking, you know, probably go back at some point to, to go back to that. And then, you know, just, I have some things that I'm waiting on and I'm, I'm in the process of writing some stuff that I'm producing a few stories and yeah. getting that kind of off the ground. So uh, right now, I mean, that's kind of where we're at. I thought that this year was going to be really busy. There was a lot of stuff that was kind of in the works. I know. Really. Yeah. And that's that, but that's also a that, global you know. epidemic takes over. <laughs> and there's a global crisis. <laughs> that's, that's our yeah. Uh, but it gives us this opportunity. I mean, I'm like watching more TV than I have and reading more and getting an opportunity to work on stuff that I haven't. And, and just exactly what we've been just talking about where allowing each day to be what it is. Some days you're catching up on, on the movies and writing and maybe reaching out to people. And then some days you are drinking like a champagne at noon, eating a cake like in bed. And you're just like, well, that's what today <laughs> was. Like, that's how that works. So, like, it's, you know, just be kind to yourself. Be yeah. kind. And, and imagine, like, the little, the little boy or girl in you, like, and being like, it's okay. You got this. Yeah. Like, you're fine. And, and letting yourself kind of concentrate on that day to day. But because, you know, we don't that's know. That's all we can happen. control. Well, I'm going to start a campaign for you to be the next Bond girl and for you to be in Narcos. <laughs> and then, and then I'll do it. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Well, Michelle Prada, thank you so much for being here. I thank love you. watching Thanks you. Thanks for work. having me. It means so much to me that you took the time. And I'm, I'm just so excited to see everything blossom for you. And I hope we get a chance to work together someday. Yeah, that'd be yeah. awesome. All right. Well, I'm wishing you nothing Thanks. but love and enjoy LA and keep crushing it. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Stay safe. So much love.